Hello, hi everyone, welcome. I'm very happy to be here again in the next uh, webinar where I'm going to talk about uh, my video series, which is more than 15 hours, which is just came out. And uh, it was a very special experience for me to record more than 15 hours about the favorite opening for me, which I was always very passionate about, but the Sicilian, which I was playing from a very young age from practically from the very beginning, from my first ever tournament, I played the Sicilian. And later on, I was playing it with both colors, with white and with black. I was also playing it with, uh, uh, in all kinds of versions in the Sicilian, the Nidorp, the Scheveningen system, the Paulsen system, Nell Paulsen's, all kinds of different move orders. So I have quite a bit of experience in that with a lot of uh, great games, interesting ideas, but I was also time to time on the wrong side. But now I would like to share with you a few games just to give you a little uh, appetizer, how it is, how it looks like when I talk about my thoughts, how I experience the games. And of course, while I talk about the Sicilian and nuances and ideas and patterns which hopefully you will be able to use concretely possibly but also generally speaking i think it is very important how you look at openings middle games and end games no matter what opening you're deciding to play so now i'd, I'd like to move on to the chessboard so let's enjoy it together So here is the chessboard, uh, what I have. And uh, so let's start with the first game. Um, this is a game which actually was one of the most memorable games I played. And it's not because I played against the Fantastic World Champion, but this game was played in 1991. And actually this game was left out from the series. So I show you something which is not included in the series, but I want to share with you because it is also a typical fighting, deep, complicated Sicilian. And it is very special for me because this was the last game of the Hungarian Super Championship in 91, when I was just 15. And by winning this game, I completed the requirements to become a grandmaster where I beat Fish's record at the time when I was 15 years old, four months and 28 days. So let's move on for the uh, opening. It was, uh, I was playing with the black pieces. Possibly I will be uh, trying to change the board, so maybe you can enjoy it with the black pieces, the way I was playing it. Uh, D4, C takes D4, Knight D4, A6. This is a system which I played also quite a lot. I'm still holding back the development of my pieces, of my knights and bishop. And A6 is something which almost in all Sicilian we are going to play it if you play it with the black pieces. Knight c3, it's not the only alternative here, but let's move on in the game. f4, b5, of course, it's a continuation of the previously played a6. Bishop d3, bishop b7, queen f3. It is also a move which I would play, and I played it with the white pieces as well later on in my career. It is a a very typical Sicilian where we exchanged one pawns only and we are at move eight. And it can be actually for a long time, even up to 20, 30, 35, 35th move, where we might be not exchanging any other piece. Knight f6. Now e5 is not possible for white because e5 is not possible because the f3 queen would be attacked. So this is also important where, when we have the bishop on b7 to make a very strong pin, but also to put pressure on the e4 pawn is something very, very important in these lines, especially when we keep the knight still on b8. Bishop e3, knight c6, long castle, 
B4. It is also something which happens many times in these structures. So you have to, if you play it with the white pieces, this is something you always have to be counting on. Now after B4, it's always a dilemma for white where to go with the knight. Should you go to A4 or, and sometimes to uh, use the opportunity if it's possible to jump to B6, but of course, the knight on a4, it's always uh, somewhat can be vulnerable. And the other option is what was played by my opponent, knight c2. After knight c2, white is uh, giving extra support for the d4 knight. Or maybe possibly later to exchange the knight on c6, and then the e2 knight can be jumping to d4. So I played knight a5. What is the reason of this move? Because actually white has two knights, but he has only once be able to put the knight on d4. So actually the e2 knight is not very useful at the moment. The other reason is that with my knight on a5, my plan is to jump to c4. And now I will tell you a kind of very unusual plan also for black that after knight c4, because black did not play d6 yet, I would be able to go knight d6. It's a very rare idea that it works, but when it works, it is very painful for white because e4 pawn is very vulnerable. So uh, white continued with g4. Of course, this is something which is the most natural continuation for white, because right now, up to this point, black did not castle yet. White castled already. We can also say that white has uh, better development, clearly. But on the other hand, black, of course, has to get counter attack, especially most of the time in these situations in the center. At least I have to react because white is threatening to play g5. And obviously the last thing would be in my mind to go back with my knight to g8. That is something you have to avoid by any means practically. So how did I react? I reacted in a very uh, natural way in this system. But here, to tell you the truth, I believe that in any case, black has to move the pawn from d7, either to d6, so to make space for the knight after g5, knight d7, or d5. I was, of course, uh, pretty much of an active player all my life. And uh, in these positions, I like to play d5. d5, in one hand, it's provoking white because he has to make a decision whether how to defend or react on d5. Most of the time, people react the way my opponent did. e5. Now in these positions, again, black has two alternatives which we always have to consider. It's either to jump to e4, and then, of course, it is a, a completely different situation. Usually, for example, after knight e4, white could go knight g3 and immediately kind of get rid of the knight on e4. So I decided during the game to go knight d7. This is the other place for the knight. The idea after knight d7, that it's not only that I moved away because I had to, but also later on to use my knight on c5. But other important part, having the knight on d7, is to put pressure on the pawn on e5 in the center, and this way f5 is much more difficult for white to continue the attack. But we also have to take an account and we have to understand that the b7 bishop will be not very active in this game, at least until I have my knight, on, uh, my pawn on d5, which is blocking the opportunity for the bishop to be, get active. What played king b1? King b1, again, is a very typical and in the spirit of the position, because the way I played knight c4, it made space for the bishop on c1. But it's not only that, it's also that the king on b1 is well placed in these structures. And also time to time, the reason is that to be 
the A2 pawn is defended, but in generally, it gives more opportunity for white, and the bishop is absolutely belongs to c1 if white doesn't want to allow to be exchanged by my knight. Now I had to make a serious decision, which very rarely is the case that it can work well for black. One very serious problem I have, and it's my king, my king in the center, where in the video I talk about it, I have a special chapter on that because it is a general problem. It's a general topic which we have to take it very seriously. Generally, the king should be castled either side. It depends on the opening which you play, whether it's considered to castle short or the long side to be good. But here, I had to face the problem that most likely I will not have time but definitely not safety, having my king on g8. So to make effort and develop with my bishop from f8 to e7 or to c5 and castle short, it would be deadly dangerous. This is how I considered, and I believe I was completely correct in this. So I castled long side. I felt that I'm in safety as the white a uh, color player, my opponent Tibor Tolnai, also castled long, but it is very much in the spirit for white to castle long in these structures. For black, it can be kind of tricky. I had a feeling, and don't forget, that it was a very tense game, because by winning this game, it meant not only to make the Grandmaster known, but I also won the championship ahead of Portish, Sox, Adorian, even my sister was playing Susan, and all the top grandmasters in Hungary who at, the mom at that moment were the best players. It was a 10 player round robin event. White played h4. It, is, it has two idea h4 uh, in this position. First of all, white wants to gain space. But the other thing is that black sometimes would want to go g5. So to deflect the pawn on f4, from the e5 pawn, and then I could get counter chances. So white played h4, knight c5. But now it was a very complicated game, but there were quite a few serious critical moments in this game. So I'd like to jump to the next critical moment, where in this position, a few moves later, my knight was on a3, which is, you can say that it works well because it's attacking the c2 or at least putting pressure, but I just played f6. Because I had the feeling that the e5 pawn can be somehow be broken up by f6, and it's a good idea. It was not exactly the best idea later, but White reacted in a way he played c3. And I wanted to talk about this position a bit because I remember that the situation was extremely tense. That's obviously it was the case. And now I was so happy when I found the next idea that uh, it was very unexpected. I always treasured, I appreciated a lot, all kind of unique creative idea, which was not a typical pattern of the position. So it was uh, some kind of unexpected uh, opportunity for me and I found it. And here I took f takes e5, f takes e5. I'd like to give you just a few seconds so maybe you have an idea uh, what I had in mind. It was kind of unexpected because uh, I made a move with my knight from a3 and actually only few moves uh, ago, I went knight a3. Here I played knight c4. Why is it good? First of all, it was very unexpected for my opponent. Actually, I can say that it was shocking. What's the idea? The idea is very simple because suddenly knight e5, the e5 pawn is going to be vulnerable. And of course, if I'm able to take it with the knight, 
it means that it's not only I'm winning a pawn, but the queen on f3 will be attacked and also the d3 bishop. Why can I do this move? Why can't white take on c4? If white would be taking on c4, I would be going d takes c4, and finally, my bishop on b7 is actually not only playing a bit, but actually it's so powerful that right now I'm attacking the queen, and after the queen is moving away, then I'm going to chop the d3 bishop with my pawn or with my knight. So practically, white would be losing on the spot if he would be taking on c4. So it was not possible for him, and this is why it was a good move, and that's how it worked out here. So I'd like to go quickly over the next moves, how my opponent chose. He made the combination. It was a bit of a complicated few moves, so I'm, I'd like to jump to this point. I hope you can follow it. Uh, what happened in the last few moves is that we got a little bit of exchange of pawns. The position opened up a bit. But let's say if we would say that the white knight would be on d4, white would have an excellent position. Actually, we can say quite a good advantage for white. Oops, sorry. That was not my move. <laughs> So in this position, what would you play with black? The d5 pawn is hanging at the moment because it's attacked by the bishop and the knight. And also white actually is thinking to play bishop f4 to put pressure on that diagonal. So what would you have in mind if you're playing with the black pieces? How would you continue the game? I think uh, probably many of you found it. Yes, d4. It is a very important turning point of the game. And I talk in my videos, my, my games when I annotate them, not only mine, but also I talk about many great champions in my series. And it is very important to feel the critical moment in the game. Usually in a game, you have not more than two or three critical moments. Especially when you see on a very high level tournament, you can see when Carson is playing, Anand, Kramnik, Nakamura, Aranyan, any of the top players, you will find there are few but very, very important moments when there's a turning point of a game. In this point also, if I wouldn't play d4, then I would be worse. But after d4, finally, I had the opportunity to open up the diagonal for my bishop, which means a lot. At this point, also the c3 knight is attacked and also the h1 rook. But indirectly, actually, I cannot take the c3 knight uh, so flexibly. So actually, white could play rook hf1, and I cannot take on c3 so easily because for example, if I would be taking dc3, then black white would be taking on d8, queen d8, and queen e5. So this is not possible. I played bishop b4, which was a very important uh, move. And I'd like to show you uh, one or two interesting moments in this game. So I don't want to show the whole game because simply we wouldn't have time in this 45 minutes, which I'm going to be here with you in this webinar. Uh, so I just want to show you some of the key moments where it was important, and I think you can learn quite a bit from that. So let's move to this point where in the last few moves, I gained initiative. All my pieces are playing in the center. This was a huge uh, gain for me and great uh, progress in my position. And in this position, I had to make a choice how to improve my position. How am I going to be able to win the position? But on the other hand, because of psychological situation, I was also looking for something which can be safe. So I was looking for something that it can give me the opportunity not only to have a little better position, but just to make sure that I don't want to lose the game by any means. 
and also that I knew that my opponent is a very tactical, aggressive player, so he would be not happy if he doesn't have a winning chance in this game. So I decided this was the reason to take on a4, exchange the knight and give up my bishop in order to play bishop c3, and after bishop c3, queen c3, queen c3, d takes c3. So here it's very clear that I'm a little bit better because white has a double pawn on a4 and a2. I have a great pass pawn, but I have to watch out that I'm not going to lose it so it can be strong and healthy. I have a great knight on e5 in the center, but still it's not going to be easy to win. With, after some moves, we reach this rook end game. I can also advise you a lot to work on your rook end games because it gives a lot of uh, self-confidence once you know a lot of basic theory in rook end games. This was one of the most important things in my chess career when as a young kid, I was really spending a lot of hours analyzing in details and calculating and learn patterns and uh, typical ideas. I used it all my career, so I can very much advise you. But here it became a little bit concrete. Take on b4, a takes b4, rook c4. So this is a typical, very important thing in rook and game, but in general also that actually with my rook, I really control every bit of the fourth rank. My opponent played h5 because, of course, he wanted to exchange pawns as many as possible, and he was giving up the g4 pawn. And he was counting on me, taking on g4, which after would be not so easy to win the game. But here there is a winning move on the spot. I leave you a few seconds. And uh, if you're a tactician, then probably it will be not so difficult for you to find it. But I remember when I saw the next move I played, I knew that after this, I'm going to be the champion. Yes, I have the feeling that many of you found a5. So white cannot take the pawn because the a4 pawn is hanging, giving checkmate. And white played took on h6, g6, take six. King a2, rook b4, rook g1, c2. So the pawn is really, really strong. And after g5, I was coming with the king. And I will be uh, winning because if, let's say, white would be going to rook c1, I would go rook a4, king b3, rook b4. And if white would take, then rook c4. And after exchanging the rook, the a pawn is going to be queening. And also, I can take the the g5 pawn with my king. So uh, I wanted to share with you this game because there are very few places where I talk about this game. And also because there are quite a, a few moments where you have to be very sharp and make the right decision. Uh, I'd like to show you another game and also a game which I was not uh, sharing in my video series, so I thought it might be interesting for you. This was played in 1988. Uh, I'd like to get to this point in the opening. Uh, at the Olympiad, the first Olympiad I played with my sisters and actually we won, and uh, I scored 12 and a half out of 13 games, so I was very in, in a very good form. And this was one of the games in the Paulsen where my opponent played rook d2. In this pause and situation, it's very typical that for the moment, for the moment, the f8 bishop and the knight on g8 is not playing. Because what I'm fo focusing for the moment, to have my pieces on the c line and possibly play b4 and really put pressure on the c2 pawn. So that's why the white uh, player uh, Elizabeth Polychroniade played rook d2 to defend the c2. So now for the moment I played knight f6 to attack the e4 pawn. Now my plan is to go somehow uh, divide the knight on c3, so probably my next move definitely would be b4, so I can gain the pawn on e4. Bishop f3 defending the pawn, 
And now it was an important move, queen, C, queen a5. It's important because now bishop c5 would be coming with a much more powerful energy, but also the rook can sometimes give exchange sacrifice on c3, which also I talk in the, in the series as well, because it is a very important pattern in any of the Sicilian, no matter whether we talk about the dragon, Pausen, Nidorf, Scheveningen, uh, many, many, practically in all openings in the Sicilian, rook takes c3 positional sacrifice is something that you always have to take in account if you play with white. And I have to tell you that usually the white players, it's one of the things which they are afraid quite a bit. So we always try to avoid this, and uh, I will show you my next game against Kasparov, where there is a moment where I want to also point out how this can work, and we always try to escape with the white pieces. The, my opponent played e5. It becomes tactical, it becomes very concrete, but obviously I had my home preparation as well, but actually I think queen a5 was the new move just my previous move in this uh, uh, in this game. So I played bishop c5. I also like to talk a lot about intermediate moves. I think it's also one of the secrets of whole chess that there are a lot of occasions when you have to, you cannot take things for granted that you capture a piece back or you automatically in auto mode, you react in one way or another. No matter, even if they attack a piece of yours, it's not necessarily that you have to move away. Sometimes it's a great game if you can make an intermediate move and you push away a piece or you give a check first and only after that you make action with your piece, which is attacked. This was the case here. So white cannot go else but queen d3. I exchanged the bishop on e3. So now after queen d3, the d7 is not so much pressured because the queen is not standing on the d file anymore. And still in this position, you can see that I'm my pieces are hanging on f6 and on b7. But still keep it in mind that how intermediate moves can really affect the outcome of the game, the final result. I played b4. I remember that this was already something I was playing by my uh, head, and it was very important intermediate move. Here my opponent practically thought all her time, and she got confused, and uh, it is already worse position. And here I'd like to point out to you that we were talking in the previous game how important to have the king on b1 in many occasions. Also in the video series, I talk quite a bit about this, that there are simply positions for different pieces of, of a Sicilian type of position. And sometimes you can learn these basics, these typical ideas, which if you have the time, you play king b1 in such a position. Because here also, if the king would be standing on b1, then white would be able to move away with his knight or her knight. But now for the moment, she cannot move away because the a2 pawn is hanging, is under attack, right? So white played bishop b7, I took b takes c3, white moved away. Now you can see that white knight is hanging on, uh, bishop a, rook is hanging on d2. And at the moment, and this is why it was easy to blunder for white, because after bishop c8, I wouldn't take the rook, but I would take queen a2. And still, it's not only that the rook is under attack, but also queen a1 mate is threatening. This is why white had to move away. One second, I'd like to try to get my... Uh, um, one second. I'm trying to get the chat. The chat out. Yeah. Okay. 
I will uh, I would want to try to make my screen bigger. I'm trying to get back my screen bigger. Now, if you see the Okay, I hope you guys can see that still the Night G4. Yeah, I see some of the comments now. Night G4 is the move, exactly. This is what I've played. So after knight g4, yeah, technology is sometimes not so easy to handle. Sorry about this technical problem. Okay, so for the moment, I think I will uh, I will get back to some questions later on afterwards, if that's okay. Uh, so here I played knight g4. If I could get back my position. Hi, I'm trying to get back the position, so let's uh, wait for a second. Technology. Okay, so you guys see it? Yeah, I'm going to hang up now. Okay. Hi, I'm really sorry about this technical failure, what I was performing here. Uh, so in this game, uh, my opponent played the rook to c3. Knight e3, rook c8, and here I just want to talk a few seconds here about that, how important it is, because in material, actually, white is not worse at all. But practically, after queen a2, white is lost. Because white has an awful rook on h1 and h8. And why is it awful? Because they are not connected. And this is also very important in general, that simply for, uh, you have to have harmony in your pieces, between your pieces. It is very, very important because the game is lost for white only because there's no harmony in pieces. And white uh, played g3. This was actually not defending the h4, po uh, f4 pawn, but actually to defend the rook with the bishop. But after that, I played knight c4, king d1, which I also like to talk about pretty much, that when you have a winning position, make sure that you focus very well and you win the game, not only win the game, but win as short as possible. Because it saves you energy, it saves you nerves, you're not going to be upset about it later. I know it's much easier to say than done, but it is worth investing energy into winning positions to win it as soon as possible, especially to make sure you don't ruin it and you make a draw or even a loss. So it's very important what I did. I played queen b3 and after that the bishop on b7 is taken. So this is also a game which I left out from the, the series, but I thought it can be interesting 
because it is one of the key elements you should take with you from this game is uh, practically to have the intermediate moves. This is very important. So keep it in mind, if there is someone attacking your knight or bishop or whatever, make sure you spend a few seconds just to think about it. Is there any op option to do something else, something different, uh, than just move it away? So uh, as uh, the last game, I'd like to show you already a game which uh, I did uh, put in my uh, series because I want to talk about that. I think it's very important. My challenges uh, against Kasparov in the Sicilian. I talk in the videos uh, four games of mine, which was Sicilian with Kasparov. I talk about the fact how uh, much he outplayed me in the first game where in 1994 we played against each other. But also I talk about the fact how I conquered and how I was able to get over on the, all the psychological difficulties, but also the problems in theory and also in the, the middle game and end game. And I think this game, which I just want to show you a little bit, uh, so you get an idea about uh, my game, which I played against Kasparov in Linares in 2001. And the first game we played in the Sicilian and ever, it was 94. So it was a big journey for me until I learned how it's possible to give a hard time for Gary as well. So I'd like to get to the opening, this game. I don't want to, to waste time now for the first 12 moves, but this is something a uh, typical knight or bishop e3 line is the English system where White developed uh, uh, his or her in this case. I developed my pieces quite well. It's a very healthy development. My last move was bishop d3. And in these kind of positions, I could also think about playing king b1, for example. As I said previously, that king on b1 is really very important. And usually 99% in these kind of positions, king is simply standing much better on b1 for different reasons. And uh, so the reason is I played bishop d3 first is because what happened in the next move, rook c8. And we were discussing it in the previous game, how important it is, the idea rook takes c3, the positional exchange sacrifice. Also in the series, I have quite a few games where I talk about the positional sacrifice. One of the biggest champion we have who not only a champion himself, but also who was an expert, uh, Petrosian, uh, was, uh, Tigran Petrosian was an expert on positional sacrifices. And it is very, very important to keep this in mind if you play it with the black pieces, but also if you play it with the white pieces. And here I went away knight c e2. So this is why it was important to develop my bishop to d3 first. So after rook c8, I'm able to move away my knight and not give the opportunity for black to give the exchange on c3. So let's move a few moves ahead. Bishop e7, a very natural development. h4, short castle, king b1. This is what we mentioned before, that king on b1, for different reasons, it is just to name a few, it's better the king on the b file than on the c file because it's in the possible attack on the c file, the rook, later on queen c7 comes, but also the a2 pawn is important to be defended sometimes. And of course, the other important uh, idea is to evacuate the c1 square for the bishop, for the knight, or in general, uh, it can be important. So now for black, it was, uh, it was a question, as it's always a question if you have this kind of position with black, where to put your knight from b6. Is it going to be standing better on c4 or on a4? And these are the things most of the time you cannot calculate, you cannot, uh, you cannot simply uh, 
calculated move by move. It is something you have to gain experience and little uh, practice also, or a lot of practice to play the games, look at the games of big champions or expert in the line. They don't even have to be world champion. There are sometimes you can learn quite a bit of the experts and some players, they are expert in one line, but they don't really understand many of the other openings. But still, even if somebody is a master or international master, they can still be a huge expert on these or any of the opening. So Kasparov played knight a4. Probably the reason is he went this way. First of all, of course, he wants to put pressure on the b2 pawn, but it would be put pressure from c4 as well, right? But the other idea is the main idea. He didn't want to cover the c file, I believe. And also there is another knight which can be put on c4. So actually if the knight, two knights, one is on a4 and the other one is possibly on c4, then there can be more pressure given to white. I played g5, black played knight c5, and then in two moves, after knight g3, queen c7, knight b3, I want to get to this position because this was the actually the first critical moment of the game. I also had a very special strategy in this game and uh, to keep that in mind there, that I wanted to attack Kasparov in this game and no matter what, no matter what it costs, I wanted to make sure that I give pressure on his king because I knew that he doesn't like it. He's not very comfortable uh, in that situation. So at this point, I sacrifice the pawn e5. And after e5, it happened that queen e5, bishop d4, and white has a great initiative because you can see after queen c7 how powerful my bishops are, the d4 and the d3. And now you can also see that the having the pawn on d5, the black bishop is not happy here. It's definitely something which Black would be, I think, more happy if he would just give it as a present to me, his d5 pawn, because simply there are much more counter chances for Black. So in this position, I did not play the best move. I played f4. The best move would have been rook e1. Uh, I don't want to discuss this now. Why? But here, of course, after e4, white always have to take into account that the e4 square is weak now. And that's how Kasparov immediately took advantage of my last move. Here I'd like to jump. We had very interesting moves here, but I'd like to jump uh, in this game just to close this uh, session with a critical moment in move 27. So I'd like to a little bit describe you what is the situation here. I sacrificed, I had to sacrifice to keep my strategy uh, at this point. So black has one extra piece, but there can be slight problem with his king. And also the other problem was that Kasparov's time was ticking and he lost a lot of his time in this position. He was quite nervous already by this time. Uh, seeing his, his body language and uh, the way he behaved and the amount of time he was uh, thinking. And actually at this point, this was a crucial point for the game from the point of view that if here Kasparov would play the best move and if he would found it, which is not an easy move at all. And while Kasparov was thinking here, I don't remember exactly how long was he thinking, but more than 10 minutes, that's that I remember very well and I have it somewhere in my notes. Uh, it was very clear that he started to get nervous. He couldn't focus anymore so much that really sharp mind to calculate all the possibilities. And the sad story is in such a case is that sometimes you go back to your room after such a game and in a fraction of a second, the engine tells you the easy move, what is winning, and actually the winning move is bishop a3 in this position. Bishop a3 is the winning move because black is just in time, I'm far away from the serious attack, 
and uh, my king side, uh, my queen side, but where my king is, is just falling apart and I will have to resign in a few moves. But this move is not an easy move, it's not a human move. And uh, to be honest, by now, I think many of the top players would possibly find it because, well, that's another story to discuss how engines influence the game of chess. But they did. And I think by now we learned quite a bit from the engines and engines are becoming also like humans. So these kind of moves really come to our mind as well. But of course, it's very difficult in the circumstances when you're short on time. And here in the meantime, what Kasparov was thinking, of course, I have to admit that I did not see bishop a3. And I was very excited because I was calculating all the lines, different moves, and I found that I really have good chances to save the game or to give a very, very difficult time for black. And I knew one thing, that if black going to play g6, which he played, after that, instantly, for psychological reasons, and also because I believe that it's the best move, no matter what will be the outcome of the game, but objectively, I felt uh, that, well, objectively, I mean, more practically, I felt that in this situation, I know exactly what's the best move, and I just smashed out f5. And uh, after f5, Black is still can be better with very complicated lines, which I explain in the video. But here I just like to show you until end of the game so you can see how I saved the game and how it was a draw. G takes h5, knight e6. So now I have two pieces down. Knight c3 takes, and this was the saving operation by Kasparov because after rook d6, queen b4 check, king a1, and it's important that now queen d6 would definitely just simply give more options for me, and uh, after rook g1, sorry, after queen g1 or queen g2, doesn't matter, black has to go out, king f7, queen g7, and here actually with the best moves, it's, uh, it's still a draw, for black, but black has to play already some unique moves to save the game. It's clear that it's only an exchange up for black. And uh, so why to risk? And also Kasparov was kind of happy with, uh, at this point, to make a perpetual check in this game. So the, the reason I wanted to show you this is because Well, I'm trying to get back my video. I'm not sure I will be able to do that. Um, yes. So I wanted to show you some of the examples which uh, I didn't include in the video because I think it's interesting and it was interesting for me to play them and experience them. And of course, all the experience we have in an opening, we can use it in different ways. But also the game against Kasparov, this was the game which actually changed, uh, I think, our relationship also from professional point of view with Kasparov. And this was the, the, one of the first steps for me in order that I was able to win later on in about a year time after this game. I hope you enjoyed it, even though with the technical difficulties a bit, I hope you enjoyed it uh, and you learned. I hope you're going to be able to use some of the advices and the ideas I gave you. We still have a sale for today and then it's, uh, it's over. So if you think it's interesting and you want to join me for, uh, for another 15 hours, make sure to get the series and uh, improve your chess and never lose your passion about the game. Thanks and bye.